staring. Hey, who's, who's on that camera? Can you zoom in on my hand? I want to just get this over with right away. Zoom in on the hand. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Oh, my arm's down there. I don't have a hand growing out of my stomach. So I think it looks like Mickey Mouse's hand. My kids were not nearly as kind. They said, you look like Elephant Man. I'm like, thanks, guys. So I broke, I broke my left arm, but I'm all right. Nobody got it. I broke my left hand, but I'm all right. I was trying to think of one-arm jokes, and I don't know any one-arm jokes. I only know, like, no limb jokes, like... What, what do you call a guy with no legs and no arms in a pool? Bob. Bob. I know. It's not that funny. I just don't have that much material for this. So just to, just to get this over with, because you're going to be wondering, you won't pay, pay attention to anything that I say during the service if you don't find out what happened. I did not fall off the toilet and break my arm. It was, it was much more adventurous. Um, I'm not sure that you should start snowboarding at 49. I'm 50. I started last year. I, was doing, I ended the year, I think I went three times, and I was doing quite well. And I went back Monday evening with my youngest son because he convinced me that this is something that you should do when you're in your late 40s and early 50s. So... I'm, it took me a lot while to get the, 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 the swing of it. You know, I was an avid, avid skier, but snowboarding is not skiing. Um, skiers looked at snowboarders and thought, you guys are insane. Your feet are locked into the board. So if you fall, the board does not come off your feet. So as you're plummeting down the hill, <laughs> you can picture it, right? Right. Well, I fell on my arm, and I broke it. And guess what the bone is called? Humorous. Humorous. (laughs) It's ridiculous. So I asked the doctor during one of the funny moments, because there weren't very many funny moments when this happened, except, can I be vivid? Can you do this on the live stream? Who wants me to? Okay. So I fall down. When this happens, I fall down, I fall back, my head is downhill, my snowboard is uphill, and I, I, I prop myself up to get up, and I fall back down. I'm like, well, this is strange. And I prop myself up a little bit, and I look to my left, and my arm was facing the wrong direction. <laughs> but your mind does not pick up on that right away. So there was a pause, and I don't know how many seconds, but I'm looking at it, I don't think it's supposed to be facing that direction. (laughs) So I reached over and grabbed my arm, and that's when the pain hit me, and that's when I realized I broke my arm. So it took them a half an hour to get to me. I have hypothermia. I'm shaking. You don't want uncontrollable shakes when you have a broken bone. That makes it hurt a little worse. And then I get to ride on the sled. You ever, you ever been on a ski slope and saw them riding on the sled and think, that would be so much fun? It's not. They're in the sled because they have an injury, and it's probably a broken bone, and you feel every little, little bump. You know, so. But God is good, isn't he? <laughs> no, he didn't cause this to happen. There's not sin in my life. He wasn't punishing me. It was just a stupid accident. All right. So we done? Can I move on? (laughs) Okay. All right. Um, So the past couple weeks, are you going to be able to focus? All right. I want you to focus. No funny looks. Don't stare at the hand. That's why I decided to sit if I was walking around. I don't know if I can preach, by the way, sitting down. We'll have to see how this is going to pan out. But, but I knew that if I was walking around, you guys would be staring at the hand the whole time. 
Now because I'm talking about so much, you're going to be staring at the handle the whole time. So focus, look at my eyes. All right, um, let's pray. I think I need to pray. I'm not on any medication. I'm typically this funny. <laughs> Just Tylenol. I did the Oxy for two days, and I'm like, I don't need this. And, and I, now, I'm, now I'm just doing Tylenol, so. So the funny thing is a natural thing. So. Lord, we just uh, we thank you for your mercy. Your mercies are new every morning. Um, on my way in here, I was just listening to worship, and I was just uh, worshiping with the congregation, and, uh, you know, people just declaring healing, and, uh, Lord, you've really spoke to me during this process. You know, you, there's never anything wasted by you. It's amazing how much we can learn when we just, when we just rest. We learn to rest, and that's what you told me um, when I, I was touching my arm, declaring healing, and and uh, there were some pretty miraculous things that happened. Um, but you know, obviously, I'm I'm still in a cast. But but Lord, you you told me just rest. I was getting so anxious about things and just trying to answer my own questions and, and your Holy Spirit just told me to rest. And sometimes I think that that's, that's some of the greatest lesson we can learn is, is being in the midst of, of the process, being in the midst of pain or injury or discomfort or, or, or just a, a tough situation in learning how to rest in you, find peace in it, in the, in the midst of it. And Lord, I pray that we can be a people where your spirit would rise up in us in those moments. Uh, and, and I think those moments oftentimes speak louder than the answered prayer or the miracle and how, how we, we can endure with a smile. You know, we could have peace when there's chaos around us. So Lord, we thank you that, that, that we can have that, that you promise us that. In Jesus' name, amen. So the, the past couple weeks, we've been, um, overall, we've been talking about vision. This has kind of been a vision series because I wanted to end up today, which is why I'm here. I probably would have skipped the service, but I wanted to be with you, and I felt it was very, very important that, that I come and just share some specific vision that I believe that God has given me in, in this house as we move forward in 2020. But um, the past couple weeks, I've been touching on how um, we need to prepare ourselves individually as, as we move forward into the destiny that God, God gives us. I mean, we're all called to do something. Um, I think some of you are looking for, looking for something else, but God's saying, be faithful where you're at. Um, I put you where you're at. That, that, that's, that's the ministry that I have you in right now. And I think some of us, we, we just have to learn to be patient in the process. Um, but I, I, I do believe that God's going to be moving us into, into new things and in new ways. He's constantly in the business of stretching us, encouraging us to really step out in faith and enlarge our vision and enlarge our boundaries. And, I, and, I've, and I've sensed, and there's prophetic words, many prophetic words about this, not just here in, in, this, in this house but across the country about this shift that's happening in the spiritual realm. There's going to be exponential growth in a church, many salvations in America. I'm just, I'm just believing for that. So we have to posture ourselves for that. And um, two weeks ago, I touched on the importance of consecration, us being, being prepared to move into that, into that new season. There's never a bad time to consecrate yourself, um, but, but I really feel like this is a season where um, we need to have a sensitive ear and a sensitive spirit to the Holy Spirit as he subtly directs us. And, and, and how many of you, you can miss God's voice. You can miss it. He could be speaking to you, and, and there are times that you don't hear it. And there, are, and there are missed opportunities, and he's a redeemer of time. But, but and I mean this to sober us up. You can miss an opportunity that you'll never get back. And, and I... When, when you're at this point of consecration and under drawing close to God's heart, you start to feel God, God, God's heart. And you, you start to see the way that he sees. And, and sometimes he'll remind you of those missed opportunities, not to condemn you or to put shame on you or, or, or make you feel guilty, but so that you don't miss them next time. So, you know, so he's drawing us close to him in this season. 
Spend more time in prayer than you ever have. Spend more time in the Word than you ever have. Spend more time in intercession and in fellowship, drawing cl close to the body. Some of you, some of you in, in, maybe you're on the live stream, maybe you've never actually come into this building. 2020 is the year that you need to connect to the body. Viewing us on TV is not connecting to the body. It's a start, and that's a good start. But I believe 2020 is, is, is a time where we have to take that lunge forward in, in him, and God's going to do amazing things in our midst. In last week, I, I talked about how we need to advance with the full armor, and uh, I, I talked about the armor of God in, in Ephesians, but just being, being prepared, fully prepared as we move in the season. Consecrated, but putting on the armor. You could be consecrated, and not put on the armor, and not engage in the battle, maybe. I don't think so. You're drawing close to the Lord. He's going to make sure that you're, you're prepared for the battle. But, but I talked last week about how to engage in that battle, and if you weren't here, I encourage you to go on the, on the website. And if, By the way, if you can't find the messages on the website, I noticed some of the current ones the past few weeks are not there. Is that correct? you can go on our YouTube channel. So if you just go on YouTube, YouTube in the search bar and just put Bethel Christian Fellowship, you can find our messages. So they're current there. You just can't find them on the website. We're going to have a new website. When is it going to be up? 5.45 tonight. So tomorrow you can go on the new website and hopefully the sermons will be there. But if not, you can go on the YouTube channel. Um, today, I want to focus specifically on what the Lord has put on my heart for, for us and uh, in this body and this region. Um, the Lord's been speaking to me about this for the past year, and this is how I kind of formed our, our new mission, mission and vision. Um, I want to tell you my process of, of getting here. I, I've prayed more intently about this coming year than I, than I have any other year that I can remember. Um, and I don't know why. Um, my, my, my best guess is that we're moving into something that's very new, to, new and the Lord wants to prepare the house. Um, you know, so I've been praying intently, and it's been, it's been an outward-focused prayer, too. It's, I've been praying about the body. I've been praying for you, some of you specifically by name, um, but, but the, body, the body as a whole. But I've also been praying for the city of, of Rochester. And uh, um, so it's been, my, my prayers have been really Rochester-focused, and um, as I begin to pray, I begin to notice things that I haven't noticed before. The Lord will highlight certain things to me. And then I start to get overwhelmed <laughs> and think, wow, this is a real problem. This problem is so big. And um, it, it, it began to, to, to give me structure and outline for the, the vision that I believe that he has for this house, which is much, much bigger than this house. Um, which is why I, I believe he's going he's gonna to bring a unique sort of unity in the body in Rochester like we've never seen before. Um, my dad has been a champion of this over the past 30 years. Um, if, if you know anything about this man, he's never been territorial. He, he'll often give this, the building and the space to churches. Um, you know, there, there were times where we gave it to him for free. Um, they were churches, they were church plants. They wanted to start their own congregation, and my dad let them start it here in this building. And, you know, so he's always, he's, he's always had that heart. And so there's a, been a lot of groundwork that's been laid, and I believe because of, because of that rich heritage and that, and that legacy, we're going to be moving into an unprecedented, unprecedented time where churches and ministries are going to be working together like never before. And as I've been praying about this, yeah, this is exciting. As I've been praying about this, um, it's just happening. Like I'm thinking, well, it's, you know, it's the Lord, you know, what do I got to do? And, and he's just saying, just pray about it. There are strategic connections and partnerships that, that God will connect a certain house to. Now, we know in ministry, there's never little ministry. There's lots of ministry. The difficult thing in ministry is figuring out, God, what do you want to put our hands to? That's always the challenge in a church. Um, what new ministry you want to birth? What new ministry do you want to dissolve? Because we don't really need it anymore. Maybe the need is not there. Um, so 
God strategically wants to, wants to partner us with other churches and ministries, and it's happening. I'm meeting with other pastors. I'm praying with other pastors, developing relationships with other pastors, and not just pastors, but other organizations and ministries in the city. It's like God is doing something. I, I've never seen so much favor for the faith community in City Hall. Never. And, and, and sometimes I think about it in my rational mind. It doesn't even really make sense. It's just that God is, God is doing it. And, you know, so I'm excited about what the Lord has in store for us. So can we put the, the vision up on the, up on the screen? Do, 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 do. Is it up behind me? Oh, look at that. I'm looking at the screen back there. Don't look at me funny. Denise, are you laughing at me? <laughs> um, people partnering with God in one another to see Rochester restored and its residents flourishing. When I first came up with this, I thought, you know, this is big and really general. Um, but it's specifically about, about the city. And, and the Lord started to speak to me about the city. I want you to focus on the city this year. Um, I don't know what he's going to do in 2021, but I know that there's this emphasis for us to begin to intercede um, f- for our city. Um, there's poverty manifests itself in so many different ways. Poverty produces lots of things. You know, fatherlessness and violence and also, you know, spiritual and physical poverty. And um, if, if you read the papers or you, you look at statistics, um, we're, we're one of the poorest cities in the country per capita. Um, and this is our city. When you read those statistics, when you read about violence in the city, you know, I was just reading or listening to the news the other day about another a stabbing and a shooting. I take it personal. When you, hear this, when you hear this kind of thing, there's something in you that needs to rise up and get angry. Not get angry with the perpetrator. I mean, I, I pray that justice is, is done and, and these, these people are caught, but get angry at the enemy for, for corrupting the culture that we're in. And I just, I begin to pray and I begin to, begin to intercede. And I want to pick apart this statement a little bit, and then I want to move into some of the some of the bullet points. But um, this idea of people partnering with God, um, I was I was googling this, kind of just reading some articles, and and there are people that are actually offended by statements like this. I didn't know that. Um, this idea that you can partner with God, you know, they they think, well, you know, that's offensive. We're God's servants. We're like, they didn't use the word peon, but that was kind of the insinuation. But it is clear in Scripture that God created us before sin entered into the world to manage the world that he gave us. It's there at the beginning, and the mandate, which I believe is a spiritual and cultural mandate, has not changed because sin has entered into the world. And if you... I mean, if you read scripture, there's all sorts of connotations or words describing who we are, sons and daughters of God. We're not just servants. Jesus even said, you're not just a servant, I call you friends. We're Jesus' friends. We're, 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 he, he says, you co-labor with me. You don't just labor for me. In other words, you're not just my employee, you co-labor with me. In other words, you manage with me. I've given you authority to manage. And I think it's sad when Christians have such a small view of the authority that God has given us. And that has hurt us. It has hurt the church and it's hurt, hurt Western culture. People hear words like dominion. It says subdue and take dominion. I, I mean, I don't, almost in every single version of the Bible, it says subdue and take dominion. There's some debate as to what that means. But it certainly, most people would agree, it has something to do with authority spiritual authority, and why has that changed? It hasn't changed. God didn't eliminate those original mandates in Genesis. Matter of fact, he wants this. That was his ideal. So dominion has something to do with managing. It has something to do with authority. God has given us authority, and I don't know why Christians, the Christian community gets offended with that. And I think because they get offended, 
They, they don't walk into their inheritance. God wants us in this season to walk into our inheritance. Because, because of Christ in you, you're bigger than you think that you are. You're more powerful than you think you are. Not, not because of you, but because of Christ in you. But if you don't allow Christ in you to come out of you, he won't come out of you. So this idea of partnering with God, I think, is so critical, and that's why it's in that statement. We partner with him. God does very little in this earth unless he does it through us. There are things that he sovereignly decrees and sovereignly his plan, but even when he does that, he typically will do that through a human being. And when the human being doesn't do it, God's will does not get done. People get offended by that. All you got to do is read your Bible. There are many times that God didn't get his way because man walked in disobedience. We're not puppets. We're managers. And when we don't manage, things go awry. This world is in chaos not because of God. It's because the people that he put in charge of it aren't taking charge. And much of his church is not taking charge. And that is not going to be this church. So if you're offended by any of those words, you're probably in the wrong place because you're going to be hearing a whole lot more often. We partner with God here. It's not an arrogant thing. It's just that's what God told us to do. You know, there's, it's, it's, a, it's false humility, really, is what it is. It, and to be honest with you, I don't have some inhibitions right now. When you go through pain, that kind of happens. It's false humility. It's false humility. And it needs to stop. Basically, people have this, this false humility thing to make excuses for their lack. And they lack because they don't believe. Or whatever. They're scared. I don't know. But that is not going to be me. And that is not going to be this place. We're going to begin to walk into our inheritance. We're going to begin to teach more about this. We're, we're going to begin. That's why we're developing ministries like Inner Healing. We want to get you to the next level. We want to get you to experience the life that God has always intended for you so you can get excited about living. <clears throat> I'm not even through the first statement yet. i got to get moving. Um, and then, part, so partnering with God and one another to see Rochester restored and its residents, residents flourishing. You know, we have more responsibility and charge in this than we know. You know, we think politicians and presidents and mayors, you know, they're going to fix things. They can help. They can also make things worse. But, but the thing that's going to really shift our culture is when the church starts to take authority and begins to love like Jesus and care like Jesus and serve like Jesus. That will transform culture. And that's, it, that's irregardless of a political party or president that you voted for or mayor. And we got to get over that, that stuff too. You know, that politics has divided the church for way too long. So is theology. But politics, I think, is worse. <clears throat> so we're going to begin to partner with one another in this place, but also, also in the church at large. And I want to get into the, the bullet points. So um, I'm going to talk about some of this other stuff later. We're going to, we're going to be doing a spring initiative here. <laughs> Leadership is surprised by this because I didn't tell them. But it's not happening next week. It's spring. We got a, couple, we got a few months. But we're, we're going we're gonna to have a church-wide initiative um, where we're going to be going through a workbook called Possessing the Land. And it's going to be exciting. People will be able to, to meet in their, their lunch groups at work. They'll be able to form small groups and begin to pray for their workplace and their, in their neighborhood um, it's a phenomenal workbook. I, I, I had, I've had, there's certain workbooks that I've kept in my credenza for years and have never even opened them. And the Lord will lead me to them. That's, that's, that's how I, I, I ended up finding the Firm Foundations book because I, I saw that book like a year and a half before I actually decided, well, before the Holy Spirit put it before me again. But, you know, he led me to that credenza and I opened it up and there's this phenomenal book that I think would be so beneficial for us as a, as, as a congregation to go through it will we'll really focus us strategically in, into the vision. So uh, we're going to be doing that in the spring, and I'll talk more about that. Um, I do want to talk about, I want to talk just real briefly about land. 
I'm not going to I'm not going to do a long teaching on it, but land is important to God. People are more important to God, but land is important to God. If you don't care for the land, I, I I'm like I'm an environment I'm an envi- environmentalist, and people who know me they're surprised when they hear things like that. But I'm an envi- I care about my environment. You know, I'm not one of these guys that throws garbage out out his window. And you know, when when I look around at, at squalor in city streets that are a mess and bottles all over the place, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart because this is God's world, and it's ours that we're supposed to manage it, and we're not managing it. And there's people that don't care about it because they've never been taught to care, because they don't own anything. That's another subject. If you don't own something, you don't care about it. You, you, take, it, you take it for granted. Ownership is, some, is something important in a, in a city, the fruitfulness of a city. That's, that's a whole other message. But land is important to God, and if you don't believe me, read your Bible anywhere. I mean, he was trying to get Israel to a geographical location, a land, promised land. It wasn't an idea. It wasn't a philosophy. It was a piece of property. And, and Jesus talks about the land. I mean, it says, through Christ, we're an inheritance of what, what was promised to Abraham. Abraham was promised land. I believe that we're promised land. God puts us on a piece of property. Whether you own it or whether you rent it, you have authority over that piece of property. Start taking authority over the piece of property that you live on. Because your feet step there. It's yours. God has ordained you to, to, to be there. So land, land is important. If you don't care about land, you don't really care about people. You can't care about the city if you don't care about the streets, you don't care about the buildings. You, you can't because that's, that's where people live. If you don't care about the fields and the farmers and all those other things that you get irritated because you know, they, they're getting more subsidies. Or, I mean, they provide our food. Where are you going to get your food? You're not going to go out and plant a garden and plant food and pull the weeds out. You know, somebody's got somebody's to grow. We have to care about the land. There are things that we got to start paying attention to. Am I making sense here? Yeah. All right. Good. Just, just tie a little. Um, so we need, to, we need to start engaging and co- connecting with, the, with some of these city initiatives. We, we've done Rochester, Rochester Clean Sweep. We, we've had a, a ministry, a, Adopt a Block, um, which... Um, by the way, Adopt a Block is not meeting over at Manhattan Square anymore. There's been a shift that's happened with, with uh, George, George and, uh, and Kathy. Actually, a new job for George, which, which is exciting. But, um, but we're going to talk more about Adopt a Block because there are some initiatives we want to start doing in your neighborhoods and in, uh, in the Edgerton neighborhood. But um, we, can, we can connect with other, with other groups that would really encourage us to take pride in our, in our city you know, and, and just clean up the streets. But again, we're going to begin to, to unfold this in coming weeks. But so ownership is important to God and possession of the land is important. Yes, physical, physical land. And of course, we want to see the people flourishing in our city and many of them are not. You know, we have ministry that ministers to, you know, to these beautiful children and they're not flourishing and we want to see them flourishing. Um, and, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take the church to kind of fill in, in the gaps where, where you know, they're, they're missing opportunity because they haven't been given the opportunity. How many of you know poverty doesn't discriminate? It, it doesn't discriminate. It has no color. And I've seen, I've seen poverty among every race. And it doesn't discriminate. And, uh, and, and you can connect. You can connect. This is not always the case, but you can often connect immorality and poverty. Immorality produces poverty. Um, I'm not saying that this is always the case. There, there are exceptions to this, but, the, but they're often linked. And uh, when you break that curse in a family line, um, you, could, you could change generations after it. And uh, I just believe that the church needs to be about that. So we're going to accomplish this, uh, this vision by modeling what it means to be in Christ and to be Christ-like. Through a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have access to God and all of heaven's resources to restore what mankind has relinquished and destroy the works of Satan. I want to read a few passages of Scripture. 
2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You know these passages of Scripture. It's just a lot of people don't live like they know it. <laughs> you know, sometimes make it, people make a mental ascent. This sounds like a good thing, but you see no transformation, and you know them by our fruits. And by the way, not in a judgmental condemnation sort of way, we're allowed to judge each other's fruits. And I think you do someone a disservice if, if someone's not growing and someone's not struggling and you don't address it. You don't lovingly go to them and say, bro, you know, you shouldn't be, you know, you're a believer now. You shouldn't be talking like that. You shouldn't be acting like that. We have a responsibility to do that as the body of Christ. But there's a, there is a literal transformation that takes place. Um, our, our, our heart is replaced with a new heart. John 1.12 says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We are children of God. We are adopted into the family of God. We become royalty when we get saved. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. People need to, need to develop their identity in Jesus Christ. They may not feel strong, they may feel weak, but Jesus is in them, and, and in him you can find strength. And there are some people that get saved and never realize what they've, what's happened to them because they're never taught, they're never discipled. Which is why, this is the next bullet point, discipling. Discipling those who become part of the, the Bethel family through membership into the body of Christ which is Christ's visible expression on earth. I think I mentioned this last week or the week before. If you are not a member here and you've been going here for a time, six months, a year, become a member. Become a member. Don't hesitate. Become part of the body. Membership is not about, we don't give you a card, by the way. Maybe we should. <laughs> that, that would be cool. We could have, it could be a punch card or we could get like perks. <laughs> Bethel points, Bethel bucks. I don't know, my mind is going. I'll think about it. We'll, we'll talk more about that. But you cannot become, I am convinced of this, you cannot become a member or real part of this body unless you become a member. Because I've seen the opposite happen. If you don't become a member, people are on the fringe, they stay disconnected, they never, they never come to classes. You know, we have a database now. We know these things. <laughs> don't worry, we're not stalking you. We want to we get better at, at discipling you and, and drawing you in. So if people want to be drawn in, and I, I encourage you, if you're not a member here, become a member here. Because we'll get to know you, we'll get to know your giftings. You're, you're unique, everyone is unique and we'll discover your unique giftings to this body. You're supposed to be part of this body. If you're not known, how could you ever be part of the body? You can't. It would be like a detached limb or a limb that does not work, like my left arm. Some of you are this. Oh, this is a great illustration. Some of you are just a fat hand. Or a broken arm. Because there might be brokenness in you. Man, I could build a sermon out of this. There might be brokenness in you, so you're staying back. You're staying withdrawn. I've been hurt before at that last church, or that, that, that I was a member of the last church, and they, I'm burnt out. They overuse me, and they abuse me. We will not overuse you or abuse you. We'll give you term limits. We don't condemn you when you want to back out. You know, we'll, we'll give you an exit plan. And that's some of the things that we've got to develop. Because, you know, when you sign up for something, there shouldn't be an assumption by the church that it's yours for life. <laughs> if you want it for life and you're effective and fruitful, that's great. But, but if not, we'll give, you, we'll give you an exit. But become part of the body. 2 Corinthians 2, 12 through 14 says, There is one body, but it has many parts. But all its many parts make up one body. It's, it's the same with Christ. We were all baptized by one Holy Spirit, and so we are formed into one body. And it didn't matter whether we were Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free people. We were all given the same spirit, 
spirit to drink, so the body is not made of, of just one part, but it's many parts. And by the way, this is well before they had all these little church buildings all over the place. So when you're reading this passage of Scripture, it meant the church in Jerusalem, in Galatia, in Ephesus, all part of one body. Now, it's huge. It's big. There's millions and millions of Christians all over the world, hundreds of thousands of churches all over the world. They're, they're, we're not going to meet many people a part of our body. But certainly, we can, we can connect this to the church in Rochester. I mean, we know other pastors. We know other ministries. It, this is what it's referring to. It's referring, be connected to your local body. God puts a solitary in family. He will put you in a family, in a church family. Not, not a church website family, not an online family, but a family where you can be seen, you can be known. You know, so if, if, if there's a chink in your armor or your shield's too low or something like that, your brother or sister can say, you know, bro, pick up the shield, you know, to block that fiery dart. We have to be connected. If we're not connected that way, you expose yourself. You weaken yourself. If you're, this, this, this whole chapter talks about that. If you're not connected to the body, then you will be weak. You are empowered, you are made strong by be, being connected to the body of Christ. And we will become stronger as a church congregation when we become more connected with the church in Rochester. I could talk a lot about that, but I'm going to move on. Membership. So it's important. So if you're not a member, I want you to sign up. You can fill out one of those communication cards, and uh, you can check membership, and, and Debbie, Debbie will get a hold of you and, and give you the membership packet. And, and it's fun. It's a fun process. You'll learn a lot, and you're going to meet a lot of great people. Partnering with local Christian churches and parachurch ministries to serve the residents of the city of Rochester through prayer, acts of service, community outreach initiatives, etc. Um, this is an interesting passage, and there's more than one in Acts. But in Acts 11, 27 through 29, it says that the Antioch church helps the church in Jerusalem. At that time, some men who preached God's word came to Antioch and told them what was going to happen. They were from Jerusalem. One of them was Agabus. The Holy Spirit told them to stand up and speak. He told them there would be very little food to eat over the world, so there was going to be a famine. Prophetically, he knew this. This happened when Claudius was leader of the country. The Christians agreed that each one should give what money he could to help the Christians living in Judea. Isn't that beautiful? That would be like the church of Bethel in Rochester sending Maybe, maybe Justin and Jessica were struggling in North Tonawanda, they, or there were people in their community that were struggling, and there was a shortage of milk, you know, and, and we arranged to have milk sent to all, those, to all those people in the neighborhood. You know what that would do? It's like these people don't even know us. The, the residents, those people don't even know us, but some church in Rochester, because they know these people here in North Tonawanda are sending something that we need. I mean, it's powerful. Those things are so incredibly powerful. It opens doors. And I believe it destroys the works of Satan. It proves him to be the liar that he is. We have competition. We have competitors. But it's not the church. These churches that meet around the city, they are not our competitors. They are our allies. If we pray for somebody in the mall and they get saved and we find out they live in a neighborhood and they don't have transportation, then refer them to a church close to their neighborhood. I mean, I would love for them to come here, but if it was more practical for them to go someplace else, then encourage them to go someplace else. As a matter of fact, call up the pastor and introduce them. Take the extra step. Don't just give them the address. Take the extra step. You know, this, this can't remain just a good idea. It can't. The Lord told me that this can't be just a good idea, you know, where the church is, is beginning to build unity. We need to be having prayer gatherings together. Pastors need to be meeting and praying together. We need to do missions work together, not just talk about it, both locally and internationally. We have got to start doing things together as the church in Rochester and, and even beyond, but we have to start here. So we're going to have to be meaningful and strategic about our relationships. The Lord told me that too. He said, you're going to have to be strategic about your relationships. You know, I'm, 
I'm a fairly charismatic guy. I can get along with most people. God doesn't want me to connect with every single pastor in the city. I only have so much time. I have to pastor this congregation. He will strategically link you with pieces of your destiny that will never get fulfilled until you connect with those people. It could be people you work with. It could be teachers in schools or principals or something like that that will begin to open doors for you to expand the kingdom. But we're going to have to be strategic about it. And, and these strategic partnerships are, are, are happening for us. We're, we, we were connected with Flower City Work Camp. Now Flower City Work Camp. We're going to be hosting Flower City Work Camp now and moving forward. Um, we're, uh, we're doing regional worship gatherings. We do regional prayer gatherings. And we're going to be seeing more and more of that. And it's going to become who we are. It's, it's our destiny. This is what God has called us to do, to bring together, to help bring together the body of Christ in Rochester. And I added something else because I believe that this is completely different. And this is something that I believe the church has shied away from. Building collaborative relationships with religious, even of other faiths, social, governmental, educational, and marketplace leaders, not-for-profits, and community organizations to bring love, hope, healing, education, support, resources, and service to those in need so as to break the cycles of poverty people find themselves in, both spiritually and physically. And I, and I know what some people think when I, when I read this. Well, what, you're not supposed to be equally yoked. That is not what the passage of Scripture is talking about. You should not have a partnership, a contract, a covenant, a legal agreement with somebody who's not a believer. I agree to that. So if you shouldn't go into a, a business partnership with somebody who's not a believer. I would strongly discourage anyone from doing that. Whenever I have seen someone do that, it has not panned out well. Most of the partnerships are broke, broken up or it's just constant headaches because there's, there's this different belief system, a different worldview. But that does not mean that we can't cooperate with people even from other faiths in the community if they're serving the community. We're not partnering with them, we're collaborating with them. You know, this whole idea of being equally yoked, I, I think it's a covenant, it's a covenant thing. We shouldn't be afraid to connect with people doing good things in a city because they're not believers. Because there's good out there. I said this once and, and I got an email. You're calling people who are not Christians good? There's no good in us, nothing good, all evil. We have a twisted, we have a twisted heart. There is good. There's good out there. Every human being that walks the earth was created in the image of God. There is good in them. Not righteous good, but good. And, and I believe that there are people that do good works, acts. They, they're kind-hearted. They're good people doing good things without, without an agenda, even though they're not believers. Why would you not want to partner with them if they're doing a good thing? You're going to stay away from them because they don't, they don't fit the mold? Now, Partnership, again, I believe, is different than collaborating. You know, we build collaborative relationships in the city so that, that, that we, can, we can help lift people out of poverty, maybe find houses for people, you know, people living on the streets, you know, find, find a home for them to live in. There are things that we can do and cooperate with other organizations and agencies to help lift people out of poverty. It's not the end all, the end all. We know what the final answer is. We know that they have to meet Jesus. And I won't collaborate with, with, with most if we're not allowed to live out our faith. I mean, there may be exceptions for that, but, but if you can't live out your faith in, in, in Christ in you, then, then you may want to question whether you should connect or, or, or collaborate. Um, but I believe that there are exceptions to that. You've got to pray to God about that. I, I, can't, I can't direct that. By the way, don't have the bat phone to God. You've got the same phone. You got the same sort of connection. You know, you can't be going to all the prophets and the pastors and ministry leaders in your life getting direction. That's not what they're for. They're there to encourage you. They might give you some insight, but you are supposed to be getting direction for your life from the Holy Spirit. We need them. We need the fivefold ministry. But it's more for building up and encouraging. You need to learn how to hear for God on your own. And that's what I appreciate about uh, G Force Ministry. It teaches you how to hear for God on your, hear from God on your own. And that's it.
So can you just stand up? I got to stand up. Will you believe for a really exciting year in 2020 where the Lord is going to be busting out of you? Um, you're going to be, you're going to, you're going to find that you have more curds that you, than you've ever had. You're going to be able to openly share the gospel or share your testimony with somebody this year where you've been like all shy about it. God's going to give you courage. You realize that courage is in you. Maybe you're not naturally courageous. It doesn't matter because the Holy Spirit's in you and he's super courageous. Isn't that beautiful? Anything that you lack, anything that you've lacked in life that has kept you back, you give over to God and he can, he can like do the thing that was missing in your life. He can provide the strength, the insight, the intellect, the wisdom, the ability, the strength, the physical strength, the spiritual strength, the stamina. He can provide all of that if you'll draw close to him and consecrate yourself in, in this season because God wants to advance us and he's laid out some strategy. He's laid out a map. You know, this is the way we're going to be moving as a body, but he's going to be moving that way for you in your individual lives. And I'm just, I'm stoked to hear the testimonies. And I want, I want to hear your testimonies. Email us your testimonies of how God is beginning to, to break the mold. He wants to break the mold in some of you. Some of you, you have this mold, you have this certain way that you operate, and God wants to release you from that. I'm just declaring that over your life. Any of, a, any of you that feel trapped because of insecurities, maybe, maybe past failures or unanswered prayers, um, God, God, wants to, God wants to break the mold. He wants to expand your boundaries. He wants to ex expand your thinking. He wants, he wants you to begin to believe the impossible in your life. And Lord, I thank you, Father, that you... You have, you have given us authority that, that you did, did, did set us here and say, don't worry, I'll take care of everything, I'll do it all, that, that we get to co-labor with you. It's so exciting, Lord, to think all that we can achieve in you because you are in us to, to expand your kingdom in this region. So, Lord, I believe that you're, you're going to be doing incredible things in this body that you're going to be drawing other, other, other folks to this body that, that don't know the Lord, and they're going to realize that the, the potential that's been locked up in them. And Lord, you're going to connect us with, with the church in Rochester, and we're going to begin to see transfer, transformation in our city. We're going to, be, we're going to begin to see multiple, I, I believe, mass salvations, I be, like, like revival type of meetings, but they're going to break out in weird places. It's not going to be in a tent meeting. You know, it's, it's going to, maybe it's going to start in the staff lounge somewhere. Maybe it's, going to, maybe it's going to start in the cafeteria. You know, some kids begin to, begin to have a little prayer meeting during lunchtime because they're not afraid what, what their other friends think. You know, I believe that when we step out, Lord, that's when, when, when we experience personal revival, when we begin to step out, that, 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 that's contagious and it begins to infect the environment and change the atmosphere. So, Lord, I'm excited about this season. I'm excited about 2020, and I just say, let it be, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let it be. Amen. Amen. God bless you.